Hello, hello, and welcome back to Best Seller TV. I am Cynthia Johnson, and I'm here with my co-host. Rhett Power. Good to be with you, Cynthia. Cynthia. Yes, you too, Rhett. And today we have a an incredible author, but I say author second, entrepreneur, serial founder first, Ryan Crownholm. Uh, Ryan is the founder of Crown Capital Adventures, uh, dirtmatch.com and my pla uh, mysiteplan.com. He's a serial founder, as in five five startups, I believe, uh, three exits, maybe four. We can get to that in the discussion. Uh, and his book, The Hustle Trap, all about how uh, the how-to guide for doing less and getting more with your business. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Cynthia. It's great to be here. Well, yeah. you know... I wish, I wish, I wish, Ryan, that I had known you um, way back when starting my own company. And I wish you had written this book a long time ago because it would have really been helpful. So I'm a little annoyed now that um, this is out and, and it helps me now, but I wish I'd have had the help back then. I, I, I'm annoyed with myself, right? I, I feel the same thing. I wish I could have written it in a past life and had it waiting for me because I stumbled for, you know, probably over a decade trying to figure this stuff out without any guidance. So, I mean, I, you know, I've got way too much gray hair now, but I, but it's here. It's here yeah. and we have to deal in the here and now. What, and I guess that goes to what you were just saying, like, is that, what, what inspired you to write it? it? It wasn't all the the hustle and the, and the, that sort of hustle culture that as entrepreneurs we we buy into, right? Is that what inspired it? What was what was sort of the the inflection point that said, I gotta I gotta change because this isn't working for me? Yeah, so that's why I call it the hustle trap, because it's a trap. You know, when you're first starting your business, you're running a thousand miles an hour, you're busy, busy, busy. There's no way around it. If it was easy, everyone would run their own business. But at some point that hustle um, starts to to stop the, stop the growth of your business. And so the book is really about getting over that hump to the next level of your business. And I was stuck at that hump for a very long time. I, I gone, you know, when I got out of the military, I got out in 1999, I started my business by 2000 while I was in college. And then I just went at a hundred miles an hour for like the next seven years. And I hit kind of a, a ceiling and I was stuck there and it was frustrating and I didn't know what to do until I had the great fortune of getting run over by one of my own work trucks that was pulling a, a trailer, drug me down the street underneath it, and I broke my femur and my tibia, shattered my shoulder, punctured my lung, broke some ribs. I had to see my femur sticking out of my jeans, not like a very pleasant sight. So that was just one act of stupidity that um, that ultimately um, ended up kind of changing the way that I do business. And so uh, over the next two years, I had just like six more surgeries. I couldn't be out in the field working with the guys. At the time, I was running a demolition company, so I couldn't go out and swing sledgehammers and drive trucks and tractors like I used to do. I had to actually manage from the outside. And those two years were really, really rough on me uh, because I didn't know what to do. I assumed I was going to lose my business, but I'm so stubborn. I was like, no, nope, I'm going to find a way. And I found a way and, and my business ended up really growing and exploding as a result of it. And um, so after growing it and starting several other businesses off the main business. So, I mean, uh, I, want, yeah. I, got, I, got, I want you to reiterate yeah. that point. When you got out of slinging sledgehammers and off of the truck, so to speak, off the tractor or whatever, your business grew? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I had to look at all of the different parts of my business. Yeah, there's, the businesses are complex. And so, um, you know, I had to look at my people and understand like what it was going to take because before I got run over, I was probably doing five or six, or six different jobs with delivering equipment. And then from there, I would go to a job site and I'd shake hands with the guys, tell them what they had to do. Then I would go do bids through the day and then I'd go to the building departments and I would pull board building permits and I'd be drawing my own site plans. And then I, you know, at the end of the day, I'd send my bids off. And so it turned out that that was probably five or six jobs. And so once I couldn't do any of those things anymore, I was like, okay, I need people and finding people is very hard. And so I, over the next two years, I rebuilt my staff in a way that would serve me. Um, and then I also looked at my expenses. So, you know, wh where are the expenses and everything that I wasn't paying attention to before? And I found things within my expenses that actually turned into businesses. For example, we had um, uh, a, a lot of electronics and appliances and things that were coming through. The guys were taking into the dumps. Very, very expensive to get rid of. Turned out that I could get a California state license and I could become a recycler. And so I did that. 
And so we started recycling our own stuff. And I thought, hey, this this would be really cool to open to the public. So I opened to the public because I got an acre and 5,000 square foot yard on a pretty busy road. It got really busy. I opened a second center. And then pretty soon we were doing across the Bay Area all of these different electronic waste recyclings. And this was just from finding one expense that was really killing me. And so sometimes if you're not paying attention and you look into your business, there's things in there that you're missing that could be great uh, profit centers. And so that was one uh, also looking, you know, it was 2007, the, uh, the housing market was crashing. We were tied very close to the housing market. And so I did all, uh, quite a bit of searches. I went on Google AdWords. It created a list of about 50 different things I could do. Launched the list out there. We started getting a ton of hits on pool removal. And I went, well, that's interesting. So I said, well, let's just, you know, and, and enough to where it was enough to make a business out of it. And so I made a website. I hate my swimming pool.com. I built some brochures. I hired a geotech soils engineer. I just got all of our equipment team lined up to do pool removals. And so that year we did like 18 the first year, but the next year was like 60. The next year was 150. The next year was 300 swimming pools we were taking up. Uh, so there was all these, you know, in, uh, also we had, um, you know, it was when the housing market was crashing, there was a lot of foreclosed properties. And so in the beginning, when we hadn't got rocking and rolling of the pool thing yet, I just went to the guys and I said, hey, are you willing to get your hands dirty? And they said, yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. We've got connections with banks. We've got connections with realtors. Let's be a property preservation company. And so we did just that. And so the guys that really liked driving trucks and tractors and doing the heavy work were suddenly strapping water heaters and putting in smoke detectors and weed whack and boarding up houses. But we stayed busy. We didn't have to lay anyone out. And so, and this was all just me sitting, you know, like I am now behind a computer. And like saying, what can I do from here? Because I'm not there. Because I like to be busy. I like to work hard. And uh, and it was it was amazing how I was actually able to pick these different things out of my business. And from and I actually wonder sometimes, had I not been run over, maybe that would have bankrupt me. It would rather than rather than the other way around. I can tell you from personal experience, uh, absolutely. Yep. That's why I stopped you and, and wanted you to reiterate that because I, if anybody, if that's what they take away from this, like. If you don't get off or, or out of your business and doing everything in it, those five jobs you're talking about, you're not going to grow. You're just not yep. going to grow. Yeah. And it's frustrating. And I hear it over and over again, particularly from people with service related businesses. Um, you know, they're just they, they're so excited to start their own business. They have some initial success. They're so happy about the growth that they see. And then they hit somewhere around a million, maybe two million a year. And, and they just like get like, I hate this thing. And then they want to sell it and they want to do something else that I should have just stayed working for someone else. And it's just because they don't have the knowledge to push it over that hump. And that's, it's, it's hard, you know, it takes, it takes a lot. And so um, hopefully my book can help some people get over that hump. Wait, so I know your, your experience is unique with getting out of the hustle trap, but, but what it, I mean, were there any unforeseen hurdles when, when you just when you separated yourself from the work, like employee pushback or ho like holes, things that you just didn't expect. You, you know, it, it's actually the the other way. You know, instead of looking at things that were worse, things that were better. It was like I was blown away at my staff. I'm like, oh, I I thought they couldn't do anything without me there. I just assumed that if I wasn't there babysitting there, nothing would happen and they would just sit on their hands. And it was like the other way around. Suddenly the guys were like, things are getting done, and I was like. Guys, did was I just like a just like just a pain in the butt guy that just showed up on job sites sometimes yelling and then so they, I was really impressed you know and, and I learned to have faith in the people that I hired now I've been I've always been really serious about hiring good people that I like who have good work ethic um, but I think that I did I wasn't quite there with the trust part and when I didn't have a choice anymore but to trust uh, they really thrived and it was just I think that it was I was holding them back so that was a really big one for me. Yeah, I mean, you say hiring good good people. Uh, just curious, are you looking for people who avoid the hustle trap as well? Like, how much hustle no. does someone need to work for Ryan Crown? No, no, it's the opposite. I want I want hustlers. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I I want to get out of the hustle trap, but I want to hire people that know how to hustle. Uh, people that you know, uh, I want salespeople that are that are you know relentless about getting getting this the sale sale done. I want you know operations people that want to get the job done and get on to the next one. You know, and and I pay you know I pay well and I you know I bonus them to you know for performance based stuff. But I want people who really want to hustle and build a better life, and I give them that opportunity. So and by the way, if at some point they want to break away and compete against me or start another business or something, I support them wholly. I'd like people to, that, to use my my business as a vehicle for for personal growth. 
So how do you, um, you know, in saying all that, it, it's a little bit scary to, for people, you know, as you said, it's, it's scary for people to step back, right? How do you, um, do you manage your time differently now than you did before? I mean, what, um, how did you free up uh, besides hiring people? Were there anything, is there anything else that you did to sort of free up time and to free up your, your days and your, and then manage your time better? Yeah, well, I think that this whole thing gave me a little bit of PTSD uh, about like, what if I get run over or something? What am I going to do next time? I might lose my business. What if I was in a coma? Like, what would have happened? It would have lost yeah. everything. And now I have a wife and two kids. And like, so I want to make sure that everything is set up so that if I were to disappear tomorrow, that things could continue to run. Yeah, you know, let's say for at least a few months. So that's that's changed. And so anytime that I feel like I have a job, I feel a little bit panicked about making sure that that job gets um, structured, put brackets around it and put a person in it and then, and push it away. And that way, when I, if I found that when I get, um, really bored as an entrepreneur, I get creative and then I start looking at what the next thing is. And so that's why I, even now I run, run a couple of different businesses and I'm, I'm always got my hands in a handful of different things that interest me. Um, and so that, that's just, um, but the, I think the, the biggest one is just as soon as I do start something and it starts to get traction, I want to find the quickest way to get away from it. And then, but to build sort of systems within it that'll let it thrive without me. And you also said like about cash flow, And uh, I'm curious the, how you manage the growth. Like, do you, you know, you get to a point where you're like, okay, we we're, we're about to break. Now we bring people on to manage cash flow. Do you, like how, how are you looking at, uh, at like raising capital versus doing yeah. your bootstrapping? Yeah. So, so I don't, I don't want to ever work for investors or VCs. Um, you know, they, they have demands that don't necessarily align with uh, the way that I run a business. And so, you know, I've done some debt financing over the years to buy trucks and things. So collateralized loans, um, but you know, it's like you know, the first the first loan that I ever took to buy a dump truck was actually a student loan. Uh, I had a full scholarship to college, but they said, "Hey, do you want a fourteen thousand dollar loan?" And I said, "Yeah, actually, I do." And so I took the loan and I bought a dump truck. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I I uh, and that's kind of that's the that speaks to the type of entrepreneur I am as well. It's like I'm willing to throw if I have to take a mortgage out of my house or uh, you know I'm I I'm, I'm going to risk my own capital because I believe in my idea that much. And so I've yet to, to meet an investor or a VC or anyone that had a compelling enough argument to let them invest in my company. And you've got entrepreneur, entrepreneurs out there right now that are listening and, and they're saying, well, that sounds good, Ryan, but I can't do that in my business. What would you say to them? It depends what their business is, but you know, once you figure out your formula and you're actually bringing in a profit, meaning how much is it costing you to acquire a customer and what's left over at the end of the day, and you're willing to you know minimize the amount that you're taking home for yourself, that you can self finance a business quite easily. And once you have a PL sheet that looks attractive enough, you can go to a bank and get a loan if you have to. There's other ways. Um, I've I've always been very hesitant, and now I'm also not growing unicorns. I'm not trying to grow a billion dollar company. I'm just I'm growing stuff that within the first month generally is profitable. You know, I, every business that I've ever had has been like that. And uh, and so that's my structure. And, you know, I might be limited at a $10 million business and I'm okay with that. I'd rather own 100% of a $10 million business than 5% of a billion dollar business with all the headaches that come with it. Yeah. And in same, does the same principle, does it apply to the, you know, what we were talking about earlier, which is we're stepping back. I mean, again, that entrepreneur is saying, you know, I... That sounds good, Ryan, but I can't really step out of my business. What would you say to that person? I, I would say if you're not willing to step out of your business instead of doing it intentionally, that it could happen to you unintentionally. And you're, you're at great risk by doing that. So if if tomorrow you uh, have a mental breakdown or, or you get thrown in jail or, or you get run over by a truck or whatever it might be, your business is, is at risk. And so um, I would encourage that person to start at least experimenting, take a Friday off, see what breaks, fix it. Next week, take the next Friday off, then take Monday off as well and slowly step away from your business. Uh, because especially if you have a family, um, you know, you're risking what your legacy could be for them if something did happen. And so I, I'm, you know, I, I'm pretty serious about the message. I think you're also, you know, you're risking by working like that. None of from my personal experience, it, uh, 
you miss the you miss those moments with your family. You miss those connections. You you lose connections with your family and your friends and the things that make you you. I mean, I I stopped when I first bought that company. I stopped doing the hobbies that I really love. Mm -hmm. I stopped doing you know. I stopped. I, I I would miss those little key moments with my you know with our our, our kids. And so I, I think that's the other danger. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I think work ba work life balance is so important. I think a lot of people just prioritize their business over all else. And uh, and as a result, things start to fall away at home, meaning you now you don't have a happy place to go home to because you've created a bad environment. You don't have a happy place to go to. You don't have like that that reprieve. And so you take that back. And so it compiles. Then you bring it back to the office. The people in the office start to feel it. They're sensing your angst, you know, and pretty soon that work-life balance or lack thereof is affecting your business. It's affecting your cash flows. It's affecting all parts of your life. It's so important to, to create that balance. Just looking at it like, you know, who do you want to work for? And look at a picture of, of John D. Rockefeller compared to like Bob Iger. Like, which one do you want to work for? Like, I'm, I'm with Bob Iger all day long. He's, he looks happy, he's smiling, like, you know, he's like, like, or you got a guy with a frown, like, you know, looks just like only cares about the money. Like, I just don't want to work for that guy. And I think that people don't want to. Yeah, uh, I agree 100%, 100%. Also, you know, it's, it's so funny you say that. I totally get you because I think that Bob Iger doesn't even like drive nice cars or like eat at fancy restaurants. Like he doesn't do it for the money or whatever. There's like a whole like, you know, thread about him. That's amazing that you you point him out as an example. Yeah, right. Like Richard Branson. I'll go work for that guy. Like yeah. I don't need to work for some curmudgeon. Uh, you know, and I, I, don't know, I think that people are just really learning that, like learning that they're not willing to dedicate their entire lives to their to their profession anymore because we saw a lot of people you know, the baby boomers and otherwise that gave up, you know, 30 or 40 years working in professions just to retire and die a few years later. They gave up all the good years. And I think that there's sort of an awakening to that right now. And we have to honor that as entrepreneurs. Yeah. So, why did you start your business? Like, why, why, why not work for someone? Oh, uh, I think I'm unemployable. Uh, I, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I learned this in the military. Like I'm really bad at people telling me what to do. I like to do things my own way. And, um, and I get really frustrated working on underneath other people. Even after I got out, I went and worked at uh, some restaurants and things. And it was always, I just didn't like the way that things were going, not to say my way was right, but, uh, but that like they, my uh, input wasn't appreciated. And so, um, uh, yeah. It, and also the way in which I work, I tend to have, uh, bouts of like incredible inspiration where I push my businesses forward for sometimes two or three months straight. And then I have other bouts where I'm just disinterested and I might have to just go, go travel. And so before, when I was younger, I would leave for two or three months and I'd go travel in South America or Central America, or I'd even just go explore the world or something. I would come back with a fresh mind. And so if I were to go to an employer and be like, Hey, I worked really hard for the last three months, I'm going to leave for the next couple of months. They, they'd probably fire me. So uh, so yeah, I have to work for myself. <laughs> I mean, I, I get that. I have always felt that the even years of my life were productive, and the odd ones got a little shaky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Try, try, try explaining that to your employer. Yeah, or your employees. Yeah, I also <laughs> tend I tend to generally not work past noon. Um, I can take meetings and things, but I know that I'm most creative between like five a.m. and noon, and I honor that. And so. Um, those that's the time when I do my best work. And so if I had to sit in a desk from nine to five, I would, I would not be honoring that. And I wouldn't be the best version of myself. Yeah. I, I, I you know, the parent, my parents, you know, and, and family members, they just, they don't get it. They're not entrepreneurs. And I, and I, um, I can't tell them enough that if I did the nine to five and I did the nine to five for a while and I was a miserable wretch, yeah. right? Like, I wasn't honoring my, my, you know, my spirit or whatever it is. Right. And, and it, um, I think that's the hallmark of so many really great entrepreneurs is that they, they would be awful employees. And, and so there's no other choice. Like we've got no other choice. This is what we have to do. This is what we have to. Um, and I love this whole idea of like honoring yourself by, you know, saying, look, I've just got to go. I've got to go travel for a little while. I've got to go get my head right. I've got to decompress and, and come back and be the leader I'm supposed to be and, and the thinker that I need to be. And, and I, I think that's I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I, I, if you talk to any entrepreneur and just say, you know, when when where were you when you had your most brilliant entrepreneurial idea? 
no one will ever tell you. Well, I was sitting at my desk uh, just after my lunch break, you know, going through my emails and suddenly, aha, the next billion dollar idea. Like, no, it was, I was out on a walk. I was sitting on a beach. I was on a hike. I was on a run. Like it was, it's, it's, those are the places where you create space. And, uh, and I think that the current work structure doesn't allow for that. Too many people wake up early, they shuttle their kids to school, they go to the office, they sit there for eight or 10 hours, they come home, they eat dinner, they go to sleep, and nothing in there is inspiring. And so I don't know how you can be an inspired person without creating inspiring space. Yeah. 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 Uh I mean, I just going like the the idea of hiring hustlers and then the, the hustle trap, right? It's because uh, a hustler doesn't want to be in an office. So so much of your story is about you had to figure out how to put the right people in places and then trust them and like learn how to trust. Are there things that you look for in people that you surround yourself with to help you move your missions forward or your businesses forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess the most important thing for me is is the work ethic side. I, I want somebody who can work hard. I guess I care less about what their skill set is. I think skills can be can be taught, um, but work ethic cannot be. Uh, I think it was like four percent of people in the world are are considered entrepreneurs, people who want to grow a business. That means there's another ninety six percent of them that don't that don't want to do it or aren't very good at it. And so, but they want to work for somebody and be a part of something. And so, if you can create something good for them, make them feel appreciated, and you know, give them the space for growth within your company, I think it's sort of a mutual, mutually beneficial place. We don't want everyone in the world to be an entrepreneur. There's a lot of people who are great employees and that, that feel that thrive in that space. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and if you, if you are one and you're listening, <laughs> but, um, I, it's, it's cause it, that, you know, when you start a business, you don't realize that 99% of your job is to hire great people and it, yep. inspire and encourage them. Like a hundred percent. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Totally. So if you had to put a framework around your book, right? Like here are the five big takeaways or, you know, well, what, what are they? Um, you know, one is, is, you know, check yourself, your, your mindset. Um, a lot of people are crippled with sort of a, a mindset where they either think that they can't do it or that they, um, you know, don't deserve it. Or there's, there's certain blocks that stop people from pushing themselves forward and uh, a lot of excuses. And so I say, test your excuses just to make sure that they're, they're you know, that they're, sometimes there's obstacles and just make sure that you know the difference between an obstacle and, and an excuse. And so that was a big part. Um, and then understanding, you know, processes and tracking. I, I'm very big on feedback loops as far as within my business. You can't have a self-managing business that doesn't have some sort of feedback loops that aligns, you know, your clients with your employees, with your company. Uh, so that everybody sort of benefits from them. Uh, and then also understanding your numbers and, uh, you know, having, you know, I have like a diary every day that I get in the morning that just has a handful of numbers, about 20 different uh, data points that I just know very intimately, look those over so I know everything is healthy. So you can't, um, so if something does go wrong, that you're on it quickly, because if you have a self-managing business and you don't have some triggers and feedback loops inside of it, things can go ugly very, very quickly. And if you don't have a system set up to, to, to find them, um, then, uh, then it's bad news. So uh, that was a big one. And then, um, yeah, I mean, it's really just creating uh, creating space and uh, read the book. There's there's a lot of this stuff in there. Yeah. What do you you talk about in the book about sustainable business? What what do you mean by that? Well, a business that'll that'll nurture itself, and so so like when you grow, you could grow a solid business and, um, and you program it, you basically set it up for a regular growth. Let's say a, a business has the potential, you run a good business growing at 20 or 30% a year is realistic. Now your activities should be for the 10 X opportunities. So those are the things that you're working on. So the business is going to do what the business does. It should self-sustain and it should grow and it should be set it and forget it with, with, with you working on it and being present, but only looking on the things they're going to take that sort of take it to the next 10 X. Um, so that's sort of what I, I guess what I mean, because the, the business won't do a 10 X by itself. It's not going to double, triple, quadruple. Um, you know, you can't hire people that can do that for your business. At least I haven't been able to. Um, so it doesn't mean not important. be there. It just means... Um, be present, but be working on the key, not all the bright shiny, but all the keys, the key, the key things that are going to move it forward. 
when you're inspired. So let your business do what your business is going to do. And when you find the inspiration and you want to put in the hours, put the hours in. If, you, if you're a workaholic and you just want to work, 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 fine, more power to you, but don't do menial tasks. And this is the problem with a lot of workaholics. If they just go in, they work for the sake of working because it makes them feel better. It's just like a, it's like alcoholism or drug addiction, right? They're chasing after something that they're never going to catch up with. And so once you just set the business on autopilot and honor like what who you are and where your strengths are, that's when you really start to see the magic happen. Yeah. And the part of that is stepping away from the bright, shiny thing yeah. or the easy thing. Or creating space to chase <laughs> after the bright, shiny things, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's that level up, like where should you be? It's spending your time. The I think one of the, some of the best moments uh, as a business owner, the ones where my employees like, should you really be doing that? And you're like, no, right. nope. but this is the easy thing for me. So I just want to be over here instead of over there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 100%. Totally. No. Wow. Yeah. So how many businesses are you working on right now? Um, well, I have, uh, I have my investment company and then I have uh, dirt match and my site plan. And then I have uh, some other projects that I'm working on uh, on the side. And I've always got kind of a handful of them that are just, um, my, my current shiny objects. And so, uh, I run through those occasionally. I think I had told you, I, me and Scott Kelly had done like a, an NFT release, you know, just to experiment and play in that area. We raised about a half a million dollars for, for Ukraine back when the war broke out. Um, and so I have like, you know, or I do stuff with Defy Ventures. I've got a book club I do with the guys that are, um, you know, when they've gotten out of prison and trying to give them some skill sets for launching their own business, or at least, um, you know, leveraging their skill set into, into an income. Uh, and then, you know, and I just, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of, right now. Probably, I've been doing more, uh, more, more speaking type stuff, and uh, so work some coach, coaching and things as well. I've got to connect you. Do you know Damon West? I don't. Damon, former prisoner that's on the speaking circuit now, and does a lot of really amazing work with uh, in the prisons and stuff. And, and it, that you guys have written a couple of good best-selling books, so you need that's to connect. Yeah, yeah, it's it, you know it's a population that I feel like I I'm uniquely kind of set up to serve just because I've landed on my butt you know before with absolutely nothing and sort of leveraged what I had to to make a living which at the time I was very strong, and so I you know when I worked as a bouncer at a bar and and then started you know hauling stuff and swinging sledgehammers and that you know that worked for me and so um, so I think I can help help these guys do the same you know they've made a mistake in their life they'd lost a part of their life. Um, you know, maybe I could save them 10 years of fumbling around with entrepreneurship and, uh, and sort of get off the ground. And so, you know, I really enjoy it. Oh. That sounds like a joy filled life, which it you talk does about. sound like a joy filled life. <laughs> I, it, yeah, I love my life. Yeah. And I get to spend a lot of time with my family me and my son are going and doing an escape room tonight. And tomorrow night we're going to a pirate dinner and then, and we get, you know, we've got our motor home. We do a lot of RVing up and down the coast around the country. And I, I, I really love, I love the life that I built. And I love that you do escape rooms. They're so good. Not everyone. <laughs> I, I had to trick my friends uh, into thinking it was one of the bar ones just to get them shot. <laughs> I, I, my, my, my 12 year old is already smarter than me. So I try to do things that are like more challenging and he'll, he'll figure it out before I do. It's, it's unbelievable how smart the kid is. And so I just try to find ways to like, like I've already reached my capacities of parents. I got to find other things of other people that can test him. I think the next book, I mean, it, I, you know, I love this conversation because it really is about, and I've got a friend that's written a book about designing the life you love and, and, I, I think this is what you've done, right? You've designed, um, in, in a, in aside from the hustle trap, I mean, you have designed a life that suits you, that makes you happy, that gives you that joy, right? And I think that's um, that, that's what the big takeaway is, right? Is to is yeah. find that joy and 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 don't lose that. Don't yeah. Don't don't get. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's just. But. No, no. I, I think I think there's something about once you once you are in a position where you know you realize that you know life is precious, uh, and you know time's ticking, and my accident could have been the end of me. Um, that woke me up to a lot of things, and then I recently uh, went through a cancer scare as well. I had I was I discovered I had stage three cancer, and had to have my kidney out and uh, surgery. This was six months ago. And, uh, and it was nice because I knew at last, at least from, you know, from when I, you know, the last accident, I'd restructured my life. I'd spent a lot more time with my family. I'd sold my business. I, uh, I, and so 
I just didn't, I didn't have to like worry about my business. I didn't even tell the people at work. I just, just, just let things go on after it was all done. I was like, Oh yeah, guys, I had cancer, you know, but it's done now. And so let's keep moving forward. And so I was able to focus on my family and you know the things that were more important, my family and my health and my education. And so, um, yeah, I went, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I almost wish everyone could have like a near death experience at some point, because it, it really does open your eyes to, to, you know, life is life is finite, you know, you, you've only got so much time on the planet. And so don't don't waste it. You know, time is one of the things I bring up in the book is time is um, time is very finite, whereas money is very abundant. Nobody really knows how much money there is in the world. It's almost infinite. It's just people just print printing machines and going crazy, and everybody is giving up all their time to chase after this this thing. And be, you know, it needs to be the other way around. You know, find ways to amplify your time to make you know, so you get your time back while other people or other systems make you your money. So, yeah, I mean, and and of all of that, Ryan, you just you said my family, my health, and my education because you're always learning. I mean, these are like just brilliant little takeaways in in the things that you say that that if you're really listening, stand out uh, as as a tip. This is the life. So this is how you get the life you want. Always learn, set your business up and, mm-hmm. and you know, read the book so you don't have to go through a, you know, a potential life ending scare to to get there. You can you can just do it. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much for for joining us and doing this and writing this wonderful book, even though it's 40 years too late for, for, in our opinion. Um, <laughs> <Mine> too. <laughs> uh, could you, could you just let us know where we can, where we can get the book? Yeah. So uh, actually the release date is July 24th. Uh, and so it'll be available on Amazon and pretty much all places online. Uh, and also you can check out ryancrownhome.com uh, to learn more there and sign up for updates. Yeah. Wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, for everyone out there watching, uh, this is Bestseller TV. We will be back next week with another author. And Rhett, it's always a pleasure. Ryan, I cannot wait, wait, wait to get that physical copy. Thanks, Cynthia and Rhett. I appreciate it.